Welcome to Game Theorem, where we have serious discussions about absurd entertainment. In this world, it's kill or be killed. Flowey, the golden flower. We're talking about Undertale. Woo, yes. I've been looking forward to this episode for so long. <laughs> Because, I mean, we're, we're fans of Homestuck. We've talked about that before. And a lot of people don't know this because of how big Undertale is now. But uh, the guy who made Undertale, Toby Fox, he made all the music for Homestuck. And he was, uh, like, almost a co-creator with Andrew Hussey. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, anyway, Undertale is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best games ever. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Because it's so intelligent. It There's so much choice mm -hmm. and oh it's just i guess we're just gonna have to get into it yeah but you know warning spoilers ahead yeah we're gonna spoil the whole thing so yeah, like one thing i guess i guess we should just pitch what undertale is for anyone who isn't initiated okay okay but even the pitch is a spoiler <laughs> Seriously, if you want to play Undertale, play it completely blind. And that's going to be very hard today because it's so much on the internet, it's hard for people to find out about it and play it blind. Yeah, it's really hard to avoid spoilers. But it's a game that's like a typical RPG where you go and kill monsters. Except mm. you don't have to kill any of them. You can talk your way out of every situation. Mm -hmm. You have choice. Yep. A choice that's like un unlike any other RPG in existence. Mm -hmm. Even like Fallout, like you still have to kill things sometimes. Oh yeah, definitely. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the story now. Now there are many different ways to play Undertale. There's many different neutral routes and variations upon it. Mm -hmm. There's a pacifist route and there's a genocide route. Mm -hmm. uh, so. In each way you play it, you can find out different aspects of the backstory. That's why this episode's going to be spoiling all of that. Yep. Because <laughs> you're going to learn who each character is, which you could only find out is if you played every different ending. Yeah, exactly. So, spoilers for all that. And yes, this is going to basically just be the backstory of Undertale. We're going to talk about the universe of monsters mm -hmm. and humans. Are you ready for this, Kira? Yep. Did, I, did we say our names? I'm, oh, I'm, I'm Kira. Oh, whatever. <laughs> um, all right, you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. Millennia ago, humans and monsters both ruled the world, sharing and coexisting. They were similar in that they possessed souls that each contained a being's essence, with which they could perform amazing magical feats. Humans were composed of physical matter, and so human souls were typically unattuned to their bodies. Humans would live their lives and eventually die, leaving a corpse to rot. However, their souls could persist even after the death of the body. Monsters were constituted entirely of magic, and therefore their souls were less concentrated and less powerful. However, monsters' magic allowed them to be extremely diverse in their corporeal forms. In their old age, monsters were said to have fallen down as their bodies ceased to animate. Upon death, monsters' bodies would disintegrate into dust, but their souls could not persist after death. The dust was said to still contain the essence of the monster, and so monsters tended to spread the dust of their loved ones onto their favorite things or places. So basically the gist of it is that monsters' bodies and souls are very meshed together, whereas humans, they're two distinct things. Mm -hmm. Boss monsters were monsters with unusually powerful souls that most monsters didn't have. Their souls could persist after death, if only for a short time. In addition, boss monsters' souls were linked with those of their offspring. Boss monsters never aged, but if they wanted their children to grow, they must begin to age alongside them. Otherwise, they'd be stuck as babies. That's interesting. 
Monsters, as beings of magic, could absorb human souls to become extremely powerful if they managed to kill humans who acquired them. Though human souls were significantly more powerful than monster souls, were the strength of nearly ever every monster souls combined would equal the strength of just one human soul, humans feared that monsters would turn on them to steal their souls. One day, the humans organized and declared a preemptive war on the monsters. Their attack was sudden and merciless, and thus began the war of humans and monsters. The monsters' resistance was led by two boss monsters, a goat king and a goat queen named Asgore and Toriel Dreamer. Dreamer. Dreamer? Yeah. Okay. So you know, humans are jerks in Undertale. Well, humans are always jerks. I in, know. Like, it's everything. such a realistic depiction of like, humans' yeah. ability to just fight other sentient beings. Yep. And each other. Mm-hmm. However, the humans' advantages were too numerous, and they surrounded the surviving monsters. Seven of the best human magicians casted a magic spell that sealed the remaining monsters beneath Mount Ebbet, and the caverns beneath that the monsters would eventually know as the underground. Okay. Only seven human souls could break the barrier to allow them to escape, and only a being with a human soul could pass through it, so the monsters were forced to regroup and focus on survival. And that's why we don't see monsters in the modern day. They've all been trapped under a mountain. The monsters settled in the caverns and built a city as they sought survival. Their king, Asgore, was notoriously bad at names, and he named the city Home. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's funny how bad he is with names. Asgore and Toriel ruled the monsters for a very long time. They were kind rulers who never age, even though the other monsters did. Right, as boss monsters, they, are, they, they don't age. They, they, they're not technically immortal, they could still be killed. Uh -huh. but, but they just don't age. Mm -hmm. The symbol Asgore and Toriel wore evolved into a belief system, where the symbol came to represent a prophecy that the angel, the one who had seen the surface, would return and make the underground go empty. The symbol became known as the Delta Rune. It's interesting how they say make the underground go empty as if there's no details on how? How? Yeah. <laughs> um, I should also mention that there is another game Toby Fox made called Deltarune, which is like some type of alternate universe take on Undertale. It's complicated. And quite frankly, since only part one of that game is released yet, we're not going to be talking about it in this. We're sticking strictly to the game of Undertale and the lore it already establishes. Mm -hmm. We'll do Deltarune later whenever it's finished. Mm-hmm. In time, the monsters left the caverns to discover that the underground was so vast that it contained individual biomes, possibly exasperated, exacerbated, exacerbated yes, you don't by know what magic. That word is? It means to make worse. I know what it means. I was just having trouble um, pronouncing it. They braved through the harsh, cold, damp swampland and searing heat until they resettled and constructed a new city. Small towns were left in the other areas, which Asgard named Snowden, Waterfall, and Hotland. Again, the very simple names. Mm -hmm. The cold place will be called Snowden. The swampy, watery place will be called Waterfall. And the very hot place will be called Hotland. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Asgore named the new city as New Home, which became the capital of the underground. Asgore's castle had a room that was adjacent to a portion of the barrier. That's really funny. Why? Because New Home. Yep. Really? Yep. yep. <sighs> All right. Um, below Waterfall was the garbage dump, where human waste polluted the water supply. Through the years, the monsters realized they could learn about human history and technology by scavenging and analyzing the garbage. In doing so, technological advancement for the monsters followed roughly in lockstep with humans above. Asgore appointed a skeleton monster named Dr. W.D. Gaster as his royal scientist. 
Gastner designed and oversaw the construction of the CORE, a giant energy plant that converted geothermal energy from below Hotland into magical electricity to be used by monsters both in the capital and elsewhere in the underground. Okay, so that's how they got electricity, right? Yeah, that's basically how they get uh, like power and become more modernized. Mm-hmm. They need the core to, for the energy. Mm-hmm. In 1991, a fish monster named Undyne was born. In 1995, a skeleton monster named Papyrus was born as the younger brother of Sans. Why don't we have Sans' birthday? We'll on? know when he was born. Oh, okay. In 1998, Asgar and Toriel earned the trophy for the number one nose nozzle champs of 98. Asgore and Toriel had a child they named Asriel Dreamer, an amalgamation of their names. Asgore, Toriel, yep. Asriel. Their souls were linked, and so Asgore and Toriel began aging so that their child could grow up. In 201X, early in the decade. Okay, this is a thing. It's a reference to Earthbound, because Earthbound did a similar thing. Basically, it's you could say it's the 20X teens, or really just the 2010s. It's so early in the decade of the 2010s. It's just this weird 90s gimmick that Toby was referencing when he made the game. Mm-hmm. Basically, most of the past actually happened in the decade of the 2010s. Some people, like they, they feel the timelines differently, but when you actually go and look up in the game the, uh, the facts, mm-hmm. this is most accurate. I just spent a while researching this. You would be surprised how much misinformation there is on the Undertale backstory. Well, of course there is. There's a lot of fan theory and people uh, like make things up based on what there is because there isn't exactly every detail to be able to determine things i just haven't seen this much uh fake facts since i did call of duty zombies oh Um, i see yeah that was probably difficult to sort through wasn't it and i mean undertale's great and fan theories are wonderful um like we we had to kind of extrapolate a little bit with this timeline but i just felt there was an above average uh prevalence of people stating theories as facts Mm -hmm. so yeah Anyway, go on. A human child named Chara left their village on the surface. No, it's it's pronounced Kara. Oh, a human child named Kara left their village on the surface. Their village was known for the golden flower buttercups that grew there. Kara was an angry and hateful non-binary child who felt rejected by humans and thus despised humanity. They climbed Mount Ebbet and found a hole that led to the underground below. They fell into it, but since they were human, the barrier let them pass. So for the first time, a human's in the underground. Mm -hmm. Asriel discovered Kara, and the two became friends. Kara's curiosity seemed to pacify their hate for a time, though Asriel never noticed any malevolence in his new friend. In time, Asgore and Toriel adopted Kara as a second child, agreeing to raise the human as an equal. The monsters of the underground were ecstatic about this development, as it gave them hope that humans and monsters could one day be at peace. Kara began acting out in subtle ways as their curiosity turned from the mundane to the cruel. They had an expression they'd make with their face that Asriel interpreted as a creepy but harmless gag. Toriel had a special recipe for a butterscotch cinnamon pie, but Kara and Azriel decided to make one as a gift for Asgore. When the recipe called for cups of butter, Kara instead gathered buttercups that were growing in the underground and put them in the recipe. After eating the pie, Asgore became incredibly sick, but Toriel nursed him back to health. Kara laughed at his suffering, but Azriel thought Kara was just using humor to deal with the pain. Azriel and Toriel figured it had been an honest mistake to use butter cups instead of cups of butter. But Kara was fully aware of how poisonous butter cups were, since the golden flowers in their old home were also butter cups. Mm-hmm. So it was attempted murder. Basically, yeah. Kara had bored of the underground, and they learned how souls work. They came up with the plan and pitched it to Azrael. Kara told Azrael that if they worked together, they could destroy the barrier and free all of the monsters from the underground. Azrael was hesitant to do what Kara suggested, but he ultimately agreed to Kara's plan. 
Kara ate buttercups, intentionally making themselves fatally ill. Asgore, Toriel, and Asriel were by their deathbed, and Kara made a final request, asking that they see the golden flowers one last time. Unable to break the barrier, however, no monster could fulfill Kara's last request. Kara died from the poison, but Azrael told his parents that he could still honor Kara's last request. Azrael absorbed Kara's soul, and in doing so, Azrael became the strongest being in the underground. With the human soul, Azrael was able to pass through the barrier and make it to the surface, and he brought Kara's body with him. Azrael arrived in the town and attempted to bury Kara in a field of golden flowers. Now that he was on the surface, he was prepared to enact Kara's plan, which was to kill six humans and take their souls. Azrael didn't want to be a murderer, but if he could acquire seven souls, he could free all of the monsters. What do you think about this dastardly plan? I didn't know that Kara did this on purpose. Yeah, like, you have to really dig to find this out. Like, how did you find out that Kara did this on purpose? Uh, when they would play around together, Kara, Azriel had some. Uh, had a video camera he would record some of their conversations on. Oh, really? Yeah, you can find them in the game. Wow. But uh, but yeah, he he was trying to get seven souls so he could free everyone. Mm hmm. Yeah. The humans in the village spotted Azrael with the corpse of a child and assumed that a monster had just killed one of their children. The humans formed a mob and attacked Azrael. However, Kara had lied to Azrael. Their plan was not to free the monsters, but to trick Azrael into becoming a powerful being and going to the surface. Kara and Azrael shared a body, but Azrael was not fully in control. Azriel realized Kara just wanted to kill as many humans as possible and absorb their souls to gain ultimate power. Azriel couldn't bring himself to take any human's life, and he resisted Kara's urge to kill. The humans did not relent, however, and they viciously attacked Azriel, fatally wounding him. Azriel barely managed to escape, crossing through the barrier back into the underground in Asgore's castle, still carrying Kara's body. Asgore and Toriel were horrified at what had happened to their son, but Azrael's wounds were too great. He fell down and disintegrated, dying, leaving behind only dust, Kara's body, and some golden flowers that Azrael had traipsed into the throne room. The monsters of the underground, upon hearing the news, went into mourning. Asgore responded furiously by declaring war on humanity for taking their children. He promised that any humans that fell into the underground would be killed, their souls collected, and in time the barrier destroyed. Ah, oh, this was so... This, this to me is like the most gut-wrenching part of the entirety of Undertale. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what I mean, there's a, there's a musical, there's Undertale the Musical, you can find it on YouTube. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The people that made it are amazing. So, honestly, we might even just include a link for it in the description. Okay. But the the episode where they talk about this... You he, mean the song? Yes, yes, that's what I meant. Uh, do you know what the song is? What is there, it? It's called Undertale. Oh, really? It's the theme. The theme of the entire game, the main song, is the song of Azriel dying. That's sad. Yeah, the humans murdered him. Uh huh. Just because they thought he had killed a child. Well, of course, humans are terrible. <laughs> uh, the lyrics, I'm trying to remember, what were they? Um, Asgore goes like, uh, once again, the humans have taken everything from me, uh, all my children. Uh, we will declare war on the humans up above. They will not once again take my love. You know, something like that. Yeah, something about losing sons. Yeah. Or whatever. All right. Uh, it was oh, so, so brutal. Mm-hmm. All right. Toriel was horrified by Asgore's desire for vengeance, and she instead promised to protect any humans who fell from Asgore's wrath. These differing responses from their children's deaths led to a schism between the two. They ended their relationship and separated. For the record, I think this is literally the only game I know of that has 
representation of divorced parents or at <laughs> yeah. least separated parents. Yeah. But you just don't see that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have to be happily married or whatever. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm still, I'm still right before Asriel dies in the musical. Asriel says, Hey, howdy, mom, dad, I'm fine. I would not come back again just to die. Mm -hmm. And then he dies. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we got to move on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That just, that really gets me. Mm -hmm. um, Asgore planted the golden flowers in the throne room, which he renovated into a garden that in time would grow a whole garden's worth of golden flowers in memory of their children. Asgore put Kara's body in a coffin, but Toriel moved back into their old castle, bringing Kara's body with her to give them a proper burial. The castle was back in home, but it had been so long since she had last lived there. Home was now known simply as the Ruins. Toriel's castle contained the only entrance and exit from the Ruins into the rest of the underground and she guarded it in the hopes of preventing Asgore from hurting anyone. Toriel wasn't alone in the ruins, as there was still a small population of monsters that lived there, particularly spiders that were unable to brave the cold of Snowdin for any considerable time. Yeah, they're just intelligent spiders. Mm -hmm. In fact, like the spiders are kind of, they have a thing that's like, a lot of monsters think they're just regular spiders, but they're actually intelligent spiders. They're like an underclass of monster. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Interesting. Asgore created the Royal Guard, enlisting monsters into an army for the purpose of hunting humans. Most of the members were dog monsters, but Undyne was a promising recruit that Asgore personally trained. I wonder if he got dog monsters just because he felt they would be loyal or something. I think the dog monsters were already loyal and they eagerly signed up. Because <laughs> when enough. you when you meet them in the game, they are so easily distracted by like petting or throwing bones and whatnot. Mm -hmm. One day, Undyne was at the garbage dump scavenging out of a curiosity for human life. She met a dinosaur monster named Alphys who had a similar, similar curiosity, and they became friends. Gaster designed machines that could train monsters on how to kill humans, and he made ones of varying difficulties to assist the royal guard. He also made powerful weapons called Gaster Blasters. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but when you're going through Hotland, there's these little puzzle mechanics you have to do. Those are the training machines oh. on how to kill humans. Oh, I see. Through the years, some humans searched for where the goat monster they had once seen had gone. Eventually, a child fell down the same hole that Kara had found on Mount Ebbet. Toriel tried to care for the second fallen child, but their patience led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in medicine, they wielded knives against the monsters they faced. The royal guard killed the child and delivered the first soul to Asgore. He stored it in a vial. So this is like, this is referencing like your journey. Like whenever people play Undertale for the first time, they're usually going to kill some monsters because they think that's what you have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. Not knowing you have the option of being nice. Mm -hmm. But you're also not going to be evil and just murdering every single monster you come across. Yeah. So some of the past children that fall like this second fallen child basically did the same thing like oh they had interests like medicine and everything but they stabbed monsters to death yep meanwhile the sister of a fish monster named Shiren fell down due to old age she became a recluse as she cared for her sister to try to prolong her life there were a family of monsters that lived in Waterfall that were notoriously distinct from most monsters. Their forms were ethereal, reducing their capacity to interact with physical objects. The family of erythral monsters... Ethereal. 
the family. It's, it's not urethral. Okay. <laughs> the family of ethereal monsters consisted of four cousins that operated a snail farm. However, two of the cousins left the farm to find training dummies to possess in efforts to attempt to fit in amongst other ethereal monsters that had done the same thing to become corporeal. In time, they became known as Dummy and Mad Dummy. The two remaining monsters running the snail farm were Napstabluk and Hapstabluk. Hapstabluk promised to stay by Napstabluk's side, but one day they started a human fan club. Alphys was the only person who showed up, but they became good friends. In time, the third fallen child fell into the underground and received Toriel's care, but their bravery led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in camaraderie, they wielded boxing gloves against the monsters they faced. The royal guard killed the child and delivered the second soul to Asgore. Asgore's royal scientist, Gaster, began experimenting on the human souls they had so far to see what could be learned about them. Gaster recruited many followers to assist in his research, including Sans and Papyrus. Sans and Papyrus lived in the capital during their time working with Gaster. They had met Clam Girl's neighbor, a young humanoid monster named Susie. Susie came to befriend Gaster, Sans, and Papyrus, but she became involved in their experimentation in a way that Sans kept secret. Honestly, Susie is like one of the most mysterious things about the entire Undertale franchise. You only even found out about it, like, I don't know how. Yeah, you have to really dig deep. And it has something. she has something to do with Sans. Not sure what exactly. Mm -hmm. Gaster designed a machine that could extract an essence from a human soul that had the potential to make time travel a possibility. Gaster used it to glimpse into the future to see what may become of monsters. But he fell into his creation and shattered across time and space into amalgamated pieces of his former self. In so doing, the machine was broken, and none of the other scientists knew how to fix it. Not knowing what to do, Gaster's followers disbanded. Sam, what do you think about that? That's interesting. I never knew that that's what happened to him. Yeah, a lot of people talk about Gaster like this. It's this grand mystery, and Gaster is extremely mysterious. But you can piece together the little fractions that his followers tell you of what happened to him to kind of understand what kind of story happened here. Mm-hmm. Sands kept an album with photos of his time working for Gaster, alongside a drawing that Susie had made of him, Papyrus, and Gaster. He discovered a photo in his album from the feature that had been glimpsed, and Sands learned of the feature that monsters could attain. Yeah, like there's basically a photo in the photo album of one of the game's endings. Uh-huh, what is it? Do you know what ending it is? I think it was the pacifist one. Okay. I think so, I'm not sure. In time, the fourth fallen child fell into the underground and received Toriel's care, but their integrity led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in music, they wielded ballet and combat against the monsters they faced. The royal guard killed the child and delivered the third soul to Asgore. That's interesting. Yep. Why did these traits lead them to go against Toriel? <laughs> like, I think patience, like, they would patiently stay with Toriel until she... Well, patience probably is the weirdest one, but integrity, bravery, I mean, it makes sense. I guess, yeah. Basically, they have their reasons. Like, when you play the game, when you're playing the game, mm -hmm. uh, you can just stay with Toriel, but then nothing happens. If you want to progress the game, you have to leave. What reason that is is up to you. Mm -hmm. But each of these children... Their souls definitely have a particular quality they represent because even after they're dead and gone, like the monsters of the underground remember what they stood for. Mm -hmm. Knowing the future, Sans' personality shifted as he became resigned to the futility of the present. He had also gained a special ability as a side effect with his close encounter with spatial distortion in the Gaster incident. Sans could now teleport anywhere he wanted, and he also confiscated the Gaster blasters. He felt there was no point in all of his work, and he became depressed, uninterested in life. Yeah, see, this is interesting. Like, there's many times in the game where Sans just appears out of nowhere. 
and sometimes and sometimes in ways that physically don't make sense. Like you'll be on the left side of the screen, you move right, and he's there again. It's like how, how is this happening? He also has his shortcuts. Like he literally teleports. Mm-hmm. Papyrus was still full of life and cheer, and so Sans resorted to comedy to pass the time and continue his relationship with his brother. The two of them moved to Snowdon to get away from the city and their past. Papyrus enlisted in the Royal Guard, hoping to catch humans and be a hero. Papyrus is so naive. Mm -hmm. And adorable. <laughs> another possible result from the Gaster incident was the appearance of a beam from another reality in the underground. They were a magical beam, but not a monster. They were a butter dragon named So Sorry, but they were incredibly reclusive and tried to remain hidden from most monsters. What? Yep. Okay, then. It's an Easter egg special boss fight. Ah, okay. Moving on. Well, I mean, some people don't like it because they're like, oh, it's like fat fetishistic. But hey, come on. If people are into skinny bodies, why can't people be into, you know, rounder bodies? Don't judge mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. In time, the fifth fallen child fell into the underground and received Toriel's care. But their perseverance led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in speech, they wielded books against the monsters they faced. The royal guard killed the child and delivered the fourth soul to Asgore. I could read these books and talk to you, but instead I'm going to hit you with them. <laughs> <laughs> a duck monster named Snowdrake ran away from his home in the capital when his mother fell down. His father was a failed comedian who had neglected Snowdrake, but he became worried about his missing son. Asgore appointed Alphys to be the next royal scientist. She was incredibly intelligent, but nervous and overwhelmed with the responsibility. However, Gaster's work was mostly lost with little records salvaged. Alpha's first assignment was to build a human eradication machine based on Gaster's previous work. Alphys used the opportunity to sketch plans to create the perfect body for her friend, Habstablook. Thus, this inspired Habstablook to also abandon the snail farm, leaving only Napstablook. In time, the sixth fallen child fell into the underground and received Toriel's care, but their kindness led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in cooking, they wielded fiery cookware against the monsters they faced. The royal guard killed the child and delivered the fifth soul to Asgore. Six. No, fifth. No, it's a six. The sixth fallen child, the fifth soul. Oh, oh. Okay. They didn't get Kara's soul. Oh, yeah. Alphys made a temporary robotic body that was very cubic and defensive for Habstablook to use in the meantime until she could perfect a purely offensive body. Habstablook possessed the robot and transitioned into a new life. They didn't want to be gender neutral anymore, and so he chose to identify as Metaton, a man from now on. Most monsters didn't know Metaton as a transgender possessed robot, but instead they thought he was a purely a creation that Alphys had made. Regardless, he lived his life to the fullest, becoming a huge celebrity with the most watched television program in the underground, where he performed every role he could imagine, not letting his clunky appearance stop him. His fans adored him. This is awesome. Transgender representation? Non-binary representation? Yeah. Oh my goodness, Undertale, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> In time, the seventh fallen child fell into the underground and received Toriel's care, but their justice led them to rebel against Toriel's wishes. The child left the ruins to explore the underground. Despite the child's interest in fate, they wielded a loaded gun against the monsters they faced. The Royal Guard killed the child and delivered the sixth soul to Asgore. What the? Did they used a gun? <laughs> yes. Pistol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that child was definitely more violent. Mm -hmm. You can see we're getting to the more modern era, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Monsters in the underground became incredibly hopeful that one day soon they would see the surface, as they only needed one more human soul. Undyne, for her prowess in human hunting, was promoted as the captain of the Royal Guard, though she gave cooking lessons to Papyrus when they weren't working. 
However, a legend spread around the human village on the surface that all who approached Mount Ebbet never returned, and so humans stopped falling into the underground as fear kept them away. Sans wasn't part of the royal guard, but his brother Papyrus liked to give him orders to assist him. He stationed Sans by the entrance to the ruins. One day, Sans heard Toriel crying on the other side of the door as she reminisced on the children she had failed to save. Sans told her a horrible joke, and she laughed. Over the next few days, they told each other many bad jokes, until one day, Toriel asked Sans to make her a promise. She asked that, should a human one day exit the ruins again, they be protected. Sans didn't like promises, but he decided to agree and protect the next human who fell. What were some of the bad jokes again? I forgot. I don't remember. Knock, knock. Who's there? Olehi. Olehi who? I didn't know you could yodel. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, I know. They were very bad jokes. I shouldn't have even brought it up. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so he Sans makes that promise, and that's a big deal, because Sans is just depressed, and he doesn't make promises anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Sans helped Papyrus make a cool outfit for a costume party, but Papyrus never stopped wearing it. He began wearing his regular outfit on top of his cool one. <laughs> Asgore found the process of killing human children necessary, but excruciatingly emotionally painful. So he asked Alphys as his new royal scientist to try to find a way to break the barrier with just the souls they currently had, to find a way that Gaster could not. Alphys couldn't proceed just using monster souls, so she decided to research using the human souls Asgore had already collected. She found some of Gaster's old blueprints and managed to repurpose his designs to construct the DT extraction machine. It was a machine that she could use to extract the essence from human souls that allowed them to persist after death. She named the essence Determination. So even though like she's repurposing Gaster's previous research, Alphys is the one that calls it determination. Mm -hmm. Alphys asked Asgore to ask around for monsters that had fallen down but not disintegrated just yet. The bodies of several dog monsters, Snow Drake's mother, Shirin's sister, Shirin. Shirin's sister, and many other monsters were delivered to Alphys' lab. Alphys injected the bodies with determination, hoping that it would allow their souls to persist after death. While she waited for the bodies to disintegrate, she began experiments to make a vessel capable of holding the monster souls until new bodies could be created for them. Alphys decided to use a plant that was neither human nor monster as the vessel, and she took the tallest golden flower from Asgore's garden, the first one to grow. She wanted it to be a surprise for him. She injected the flower with determination, but she saw no immediate results. Alphys became distraught when the bodies never disintegrated like they should have, so she injected more determination in the, into the bodies just to get something to happen. The procedure worked when, one day, the Fallen woke back up like nothing had happened, successfully bringing them back to life. Alphys had managed resurrection, but her goal of breaking the barrier was a failure, so she concluded the experiment and sent the human souls, along with the golden flower, back to Asgore. However, Alphys had been too optimistic. Monster souls were incapable of processing determination and retaining their magically constituted forms. The result was that the monster she resurrected became liquefied and started melding together into eldritch abominations that she called amalgamates. When the golden flower was returned in the garden, it awoke. Long ago, the dust of Azrael had been poured into that flower, and had now been given determination and the will to live, though it lacked a soul, possessing only a vacuum where one should be. It possessed the memories of Azrael, and awoke in disbelief that he was now a flower. What do you think about that? That was, that's really sad. Azrael's alive now as a what, flower. Wait, what happened to Kara's soul if Azrael doesn't have one anymore? What happened to Kara's soul? We'll get to that. Okay. Because remember, Azrael and Kara's soul was kind of mixed together a little bit, you know? Mm hmm. Azrael cried and cried until Asgore found him. 
Asgord cared for him, thinking it a miracle that his son was back. However, Asriel was without a soul, and he found himself incapable of feeling love. After a few weeks of living with Asgore and failing to feel anything, Azrael ran away until he reached the ruins. He hoped that Toriel could make him feel whole again, but no matter how much love she gave him, he couldn't reciprocate. Azrael couldn't stand his current existence, and so he killed himself. However, as he was dying, the primal determination within him raged as he came to regret his decision. Not wanting to die, he awoke. His determination had allowed him to reset time back to his save point, which was the moment he awoke as a flower. Asriel, That's crazy, right? Yeah. Azrael realized his ability to reset time and tried to accept his new life, knowing that death wasn't an answer he would accept. He renamed himself to Flowey. Flowey lived many lives, at first learning and discovering the many characters in the underground and how life had changed. He tried befriending them and being nice to them, but he was unfulfilled and found himself bored even with happy endings. Flowey began to experiment with save points to see more interesting timelines. While he couldn't love, he could feel amused momentarily. Before long, he started living lives where he killed and massacred people in the underground just to see what would happen. Even with the immense power he held over the others with his determination, Flowey bored of life in the underground. He formed a plan to steal the six human souls in the hopes of breaking the barrier to get to the surface. He knew he'd need to figure out a way to get a seventh soul, but even if he failed to do that, he relished the thought of having penultimate power. Unfortunately for Flowey, try as he might, Asgore never allowed him to see the human souls, and Flowey was never strong enough to take down Asgore. Sans, meanwhile, realized that someone was messing with the timeline. He developed secret code words that he knew no one would know. If anyone ever spoke those code words, he could identify them as a time traveler. In several timelines, Flowey was killed by Sans, who turned out to be too powerful for Flowey to defeat as well. In the end, none of Flowey's actions were enough to get an outcome he felt desirable. He resigned himself to the fact that he would have to wait for an uncertain future to come to pass before enacting his plan. Flowey awoke at his earliest save point in the garden again, resetting the timeline once more. He snuck away towards the ruins. Alfisa's anxiety had never been more severe. She locked the amalgates away in her amalgamate. amalgamate away in her true lab while receiving constant calls and letters from their families asking about what had happened with their loved ones. She received word that the flower had never made it to Asgore. Furthermore, Alfis hadn't spoken to Metaton in a long time. They weren't really friends anymore. He lost his patience asking her when his more photogenic robotic body would be complete, but she purposefully procrastinated working on it because she felt that, should his body ever be completed, Metaton might stop talking to her altogether. Uh, Alfie's anxieties, it's just like, come on, don't sabotage yourself. Mm -hmm. Alfie's became incredibly depressed. She slacked off from her duties, spending most of her time either at the garbage dump or watching the anime she collected there. Oh, she loves anime. Mm-hmm. Flowey spent some time whispering to Papyrus, telling him bits of the future. Papyrus wasn't sure whether to believe Flowey, but no other monsters believed Papyrus when he spoke of a talking flower. Flowey, meanwhile, continued on towards the ruins. You're not sure how to say this next part? Yeah. Okay, well, the next part says, like, in 2016, late in the decade. Okay. Basically, you know, uh, this next part, the next thing that happens, and the first child that fell, all of that happened in the 2010s. Yeah. Because there's, there's evidence that shows that when Kara fell, it was in the 2010s. There's mm -hmm. evidence that shows when this happens, it was also still the 2010s. Yeah. I know it implies that it happened over centuries, but it... Quite frankly, just that's just not how it worked. Yeah. All right. Another non-binary child from the human village wandered towards Mount Ebbet and fell into the underground, despite the legend's warning. The child's name was Frisk, and they were the eighth fallen child to fall into the underground. 
However, when Frisk fell into the underground, they fell onto a bed of golden flowers that Toriel had planted above Kara's grave. Much like how Asriel's essence survived in the flowers and had lived on inside Flowey, Kara's essence survived in these flowers and entered Frisk's body. Fortunately, Kara did not have a soul nor body and only lay dormant within Frisk. While Frisk laid unconscious, Flowey learned something about his determination. He found out that only one person in a given timeline could have the power to save, and that power would always belong to the most determined person in that timeline. Now that Frisk was in the underground with the human soul and the essence of Kara, Flowey was dethroned from his position as the most de determined. However, while he could not control saves anymore, he was still very much aware of them and the timelines. Flowey, realizing he was no longer invulnerable to consequences, may have been terrified if it was not for his excitement at another human entering the underground. He decided that he would at least play a deciding role in their journey. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's the backstory of Undertale. Yep. That's when you start the game and <laughs> you play as Frisk and or Kara, depending on how you're looking at it yeah. and the choices you make. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I honestly learned a lot about how things work that I didn't know before. Oh, yeah. this Because, like, a lot of timelines are based on human history or whatnot, like the real world and just with slight differences. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is a completely new world with timelines and everything and monsters and the way that, like, souls work means that you had to kind of get a whole new lexicon and vocabulary to even be able to understand what happened here. Yeah, it was really interesting, though. Yeah. And again, I maintain most of the story happens in the 2010s. Yeah. So it just... It had to happen over years, though, because eight children fell within the 2010s. Yeah. So it had to have happened, like, Kara was, like, maybe 2010, and Frisk was maybe 2019. Yeah. You know, so, I don't know, something like that. It makes more sense for the children to be spaced out more, but they just didn't do that. Right, because the game clearly says that Kara fell in 2010 in the game's intro. Yeah. Not only that, there's a calendar that Asgore has that has 20... Uh, Sorry, I said 2010. I meant 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, Asgore also has a calendar that has 2016 marked, and it's said to be an old calendar. Oh, I see. So again, it's clear Kara fell in 2016. Uh -huh. But at the same time, it's also clear when you're playing as the new kid, Frisk, who's possessed by Kara-ish, kind of, um, it's clear that your, the current day is also 20 x Yeah. All Some right. people tried saying, because like, we know that Papyrus and Undying were born in 95 and 98, or 96, whatever, in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, some people have said, well, maybe it's like 100 years in the future and the kids fell over 100 years time. That doesn't really work because you do, in one of the endings, eventually get to see the top side world, and it's very obviously in the 20-teens. It's very obviously well, in modern just, day. not just that. The way it specifically says that the first child fell during this time, and then and then the most recent child fell at well, this time. Well, some people say that maybe they did, but maybe you're just playing in 21 x teen. Oh, uh, whatever. But again, that the yeah. evidence does not support that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are a lot of theories. Like, there's so many theories revolving around Gaster. And to me, it almost obscures the actual interesting bit. There should be more theories about Susie. I was totally caught off guard when I found out about Susie because no one talks about her. Uh, or very few people do. Ah, uh, okay. I wonder if Susie was, like, something they added in as an Easter egg or whatever and just didn't think to explain. I don't know. Sansa's password system was awesome. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, the characters in Undertale are just amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was just Kara, I'd feel like, oh, that's bad non-binary representation because the only non-binary person you have is an evil, hateful murderer. Mm -hmm. But you also have Frisk, who's the opposite of that. Yep. And so, the other kids who fell over the years. It really, I think, shows a spectrum that, you know, everyone is good or bad and some people are non-binary. Like, they actually exist and they're mm -hmm. people just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was really 
really cool. And the fact that Metaton is a transgender ghost robot. Yeah, that was really interesting. It's a little different. Instead of going from like he or she, you know, being born as most people are in our real world uh -huh. and becoming either a she or he or a they, right? Mm -hmm. Metaton as a ghost was born a they. Yeah. But decided to transition and become a he. Yep. <laughs> So that's interesting. Yeah. Also, a uh, hapstab look, as Metaton used to be no known as, uh, was a pinkish ghost. So while they may have been a they, they were at their, the very least feminine. Mm -hmm. And it seems Metaton never actually dropped that color scheme, because yeah. Metaton still has like pinkish purple uh, uh, aspects, flares to his design. Yep. It's really cool. I yeah. love it. Yeah. He's a little, a little snobby. You know what I mean? I guess, yeah. Just because, like, I think his fame's all gone to his head mm -hmm. a little bit. But he's still really cool. And when it really comes down to it, he's a kind person. Mm -hmm. I think he just, he gets he gets really fed up with Alphys. Mm -hmm. And I kind of understand Alphys is a complex character with good and bad qualities. Yeah. But ultimately, like, I think her, her biggest problem is self-destruction. Yeah. She's so hard on herself. Which is why... I think Undyne really is a good friend for her to have to help balance her out. Yeah, because Undyne is very confident. Extremely confident. <laughs> I like Undyne. Yeah. Oh, we didn't really talk about this. lesbian couple. But un like Alfie's lies to Undyne, telling her that all the anime that she's watching is human history. So Undyne thinks anime is real. Yeah. And bases her combat stances and whole persona off of anime. Yeah, it's really cool. Like she's she's actually described as the heroine of Undertale. You're not the hero, she is. <laughs> yep. Cuz this is a story about monsters. You're playing a human and invading their world. Mhm. Mm and there are a lot of things that get you to that conclusion, you know? You're surrounded by monsters. Yeah, I mean like it's the underworld, it's the underground. You know what like Asgore represents? What? He, he represents Satan. Oh, really? He's a goat, a monster evil goat. Well, he's not evil, but like the humans thought or acted like he was evil, you know? Mm -hmm. And But really, he was misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because the whole game is about making you think like, oh, you, you play an RPG and you just slaughter monsters right and left. That's what fantasy teaches you. Go listen to our fantasy stereotypes. <laughs> and that's, that's a great episode. I love that one. Uh, but turns out, no, the monster of Undertale is none of the literal monsters. It's you. It's you. Yeah. Or it could be you. Uh -huh. In fact, it probably will be you. Yeah. Unless you do the pacify ending, you're the monster. Pacifist. Pacifist, yes. Yeah. Uh, because at most people, when they play it the first time, they're going to get a neutral ending unless they know ahead of time about spoilers and the secrets of the game. Mm -hmm. It's a really good game. Yes, it is. Also, go listen to our episode about killable people and zombies. We talked all about what makes a monster a monster. And I think uh, Undertale really plays with that very well and subverts oh, yeah, your definitely. expectations about what you think a monster is. Oh, yeah. Are there any particular monsters that you thought were really clever in the game? Just like minor ones that we haven't really talked about? Um, I kind of like the way they use Monster Kid. Oh, I, yeah, I felt Monster Kid should have had a better name, to be honest. Well, yeah, obviously. but I, I think they I, wanted you to know that this is a young monster. Yeah, but it was an interesting way that they used the kid. Yeah, it, uh, Monster Kid showed Undyne's humanity, that even though she was this fierce warrior, she wasn't just going to kill a kid to get to you. Yeah. That she was going to make sure that that kid was safe. Uh-huh. And, um, oh, also the monsters can't really seem to tell how old you are as a human. They don't no, really they know can't. that you're a child. Yeah. To, to them, children and adults are, like, all the same. Yeah. But given that they've only ever seen, like, seven humans before, it's kind of understandable, their ignorance. Of course. Um, except for Asgore, probably, and Toriel. Yeah, but they have more experience. Well, they treated you like a child. Uh-huh. Um, what else? Oh, I like Sunderplane. Mm, who's that? Sunderplane was a monster that was in the shape of an airplane with like this like frock kind of uh, hairstyle with a hat thing. Okay. And uh, like whenever you're fighting Sunderplane, it says Sunderplane approaches you reluctantly. 
<laughs> it's based on the tsundere anime trope. Baka. Yes, basically. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, she uh, often she'll be like, like it'll say that she does something, and she'll be like, "No, I don't." <laughs> I don't know. I just I think I think it's amusing. Yep. Um. Oh. Oh. Slime. Mm-hmm. Uh, mold. Uh, mold small. That's what his name is. There's a there's a slime creature called Mold Small. Mm-hmm. When uh, because a lot of times when creatures they won't attack you, they'll just do something, right? Yeah. They will sometimes attack you, but mm-hmm. Mold Small doesn't really attack so much as it does a sexy wiggle. Oh my god, that was funny. <laughs> Which means like Mold Small is kind of trying to flirt with you. It's weird. <laughs> and it's a slime creature. Yep. Also, Shiren we were talking about. Yeah. She looks like she's some type of mermaid creature. But oh. actually, she's just a fish head. And her body is a slug. And the slug is her agent. Because she wants to try to become like a pop star. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Ah, oh, this game was so amazing. Mm-hmm. I should mention... The character un- design was amazing. Undertale was referenced in the finale of Homestuck. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. If only Homestuck could appear in Undertale. <laughs> Officially make the universe as Maybe link. in Delta Rune. Ah, maybe, who knows. I really wish they would finish Delta Rune already, because I don't want to just play the first part and have to wait for years to find out the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get that. <sighs> All right. Well, we haven't done a proper sign-off in a while. We haven't? No. <laughs> so, um, we have a Twitter account, Game Theorems. Check it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have an email, gametheorems at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. We have a website. like You can just Google and find it, and it has all the social media on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a boost in views recently because we helped this guy called Loxton with a Pokemon video. Mm-hmm. I hope there's more to come with that. I think our next episode is going to have to be about Pokemon. All right, cool. Hopefully it'll be out by the time the new games come out. Mm-hmm. Anything else we should clarify? Uh, I think we're good. I guess I could mention that in our Papers, Please episode, uh, we found out only after the fact, one of our friends gave us some corrections, that we did a very simplified version of communism, really more Stalinism. So I oh, guess I yeah. guess I'll just mention that now since we have the time. <laughs> this episode went a little short for some reason. We really need to do a revisit on Undertale sometime to talk about the actual gameplay once you start the game. Yep. Maybe yep. even multiple routes. We'll see. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm Kyle. I'm Kira. This has been fun. Bye. Bye. <laughs>